So this particular uh, case studies and color variation in humans, you'll note that they ask you, how would you define race? There are two, race is only a word used in a social construct. So in society, race is something that actually exists, but biologically, race is not... is not something that's uh, considered valid. That being said, populations are important and there are some correlations between this word race, right? There's a correlation between this word race and uh, sexual selection, and therefore they create what we call a gene pool. So gene pools are individuals in a population and the various genes and alleles they have. So pick a gene, let's say call it A, how many little A's and big A's do you have in this pool of genes? So that's, of course, only one gene. And as we discussed earlier, it's likely tens of thousands of genes or at least 10,000 genes. And each one of those interact with each other and some of them impact each other. So... Each one, most of those produce proteins. And so in this gene pool, this, this collection of genes that we call a population, that's a scientific term. That's a definition. The problem with trying to consider race as a scientific term is that race is mostly perceived. Now, there is something called culture, like African-American culture or or uh, or Mexican culture or, or what have you, or Mexican-American or Chicano culture, these do exist. And again, associated with, this, with these things called gene pools or a population that interbreed, therefore a collection of genes. But race as, as a unit, as a word, doesn't really make a lot of sense biologically. It doesn't really have a lot of impact. Now, if you took a racial group uh, and you started and you started listing those, you know, uh, call it X, Y, and Z, and you started identifying a distinguishing feature to that race. Uh, let's say, dark skin, light skin, uh, I don't know, medium skin. This is a, even even this even looking at this uh, even looking at skin color just to, just as dark light or medium this in itself is insufficient since since there's no such thing as really dark light or medium there's all kinds of gradations in between but we could call it. We can ask, is this an external trait or is it an internal trait? And what you'll find is that in every, in every case or most cases when it comes to this idea, this word race, they're really just external features or traits that we can identify. We really don't get down to the gene. We don't really get down to the thing that's inherited because you don't inherit skin color, really. You inherit a gene or a set of genes whose result then is a skin color. Of course, there is a correlation, but it's not a direct, it's not one-to-one. -one. So let's go ahead and take a look at really the rest of this. As you can see here, we're going to look at zebrafish. Uh, anyone, any of those of you that study, they go into uh, CNIP this summer,
if we still have it. Uh, we look at you can look at pigmentation in the in the zebrafish, just like we have pigmentation in humans. Uh, as you can see here, you can I'll give you uh, you should have read this already in class. I'll take a moment here to let you refresh yourself. So this this reading is and again you've done it in class. This reading has uh, has this word species and Jake in the story got very excited over this this possible new species. You know, it's always someone's dream to to uh, discover a new species. So the, it begs the question: What is a species, right? Like, what what does that even mean? And is species somehow related to this word race that we use with humans in our society? Species, biologically speaking, of course, since it is a biological word, means that individuals in a po an individual in a population, or a group of individuals in a population, have diverged, have accumulated. Let's say have accumulated. Another word for accumulated is collected enough mutations that they are significantly different. the original population. So different, so different that, so different that these individuals often can not or do not, let me rephrase that, often do not mate and have progeny with children in the previous population. The original population, say previous. Right? So a really great example, it's a sad example because it's the example is only pro likely only true because of global climate change. But I think everyone's seen and knows about polar bears And then there's an equally large type of bear called a grizzly. Now grizzlies are brown and polar bears are white. I think most people would say they're two different species and they would be right. Grizzlies are a type of our species and polar bears are a species. In nature, they normally don't meet each other. They don't mate with each other. They don't produce progeny. Uh, polar bears like polar bears and grizzly bears li like grizzly bears and that's how that's how that moves uh, in nature normally because of global climate change polar bears have had to leave their their normal environment their isolated uh, you know their their arctic uh, their arctic environment and they've had to come down into the tundra they've they've met grizzly bears and they've mated with grizzly bears, and now there are hybrids. Now the question is, are they, is, are they the same species? So you see, science has a problem even in defining a species, right? Let alone race. Race has no real distinguishing factors. You can say, okay, this person's definitely this race. Uh, you can, we can talk about gene pools. We can talk about populations. That's re relatively easily measurable, right? But race isn't really something you can really measure and say, okay, these guys belong to this group. When we look at grizzly bears and polar bears, uh, even when we know that they're 
it's pretty obvious they're two different species. They come together and they, and, and they produce, you know, these hybrids that can have babies. And so, you know, one definition of a species, you know, if two things can't, let's be clear, if you have two populations, even if they look alike, two populations that cannot mate and produce offspring, right? If these two can't mate and produce offspring that that can then uh, that are reproductively viable, in other words, they can keep having babies, then they're definitely two different species. Like for instance, a dog and a cat can't have babies. I mean, they just won't. It's not bio- a, they will not have any viable offspring that can have offspring. There's a good example of uh, example of this type of of uh, of mating that shows that they're not these with hybrids and grizzlies. There's a question: Are are they the same species? Then we still consider polar bears and grizzlies different species, uh, even though they can have babies. They can have babies. They can produce hybrids. When we look at a tiger and a lion. That is an example that we're, I was trying to get to up here with two populations that cannot produce offspring that produce offspring. Fertile offspring, right? So you have to, you have, they have to not just be able to make babies, but they have to make babies that can make babies. So a tiger and a lion, they can come together and they can make a creature known as a liger. So they can produce something called a liger. It's large. It's it, like the polar bear and the grizzly bear. The, the liger is, is very much uh, a combination of the two populations so they can produce babies, but the liger is sterile. It can't produce children. So we don't consider tiger lion. Or tiger and lion are definitely two different species. Even though they can come together and make a, a, a child, they can't, or an offspring, they cannot make an offspring that's fertile. Another good example of this is a, don- is a donkey and a horse. Now, those two are very similar, just like a tiger and a lion are similar. They can come together and they can make a mule. Mules are in between a horse and a donkey in size. They're smart, smarter than a horse, uh, hard workers, not as, not as bullheaded as a donkey, uh, bigger than a donkey so they can carry more weight. But the mule is sterile. You, you cannot produce any more offspring. So because of that, both the horse and the donkey are definitely two different species. Both the tiger and the lion are definitely two different species. I don't know if, uh, you know, polar bears and grizzlies uh, still consider two different species, uh, but they can produce hybrids. Are are those hybrids uh, fertile? I'm not sure what the answer to that would be, but I know they can. So the point is that even with species, the word species, which seems like it should be a fairly well drawn out line, it's really not cut and dry. And with species, as you can tell, with a tiger and a lion, you can definitely tell they're they're different. But we can't really draw a clear line since they can have babies with each other, right? But luckily, uh, when it comes to tiger and lion, we can much more easily just look at the next generation and say, okay, they're not, they're not able to make babies. They're sterile, so they're definitely two different species. I'm sorry my cats are going to be meowing in the background. I do apologize. They often do not mate and have pro- a progeny with other... Okay, so, it's, so in a species can be a flexible definition. But it is defined. It's something still that can be measured. And there are lines that, that where we can say, okay, these are definitely two different species, like with a tiger and a lion, like with a donkey and a horse. Uh, 
like with a fish and a bird. Like we can say, okay, they're for sure different enough. They've collected enough differences that they can't have babies easily or at least don't do it naturally. Don't do it in nature where they live, where, they've, where they're found. And zebrafish are very similar. Uh, as you can see, these scientists produce these kind of, uh, these individuals with uh, zebrafish where they have uh, uh, fewer melanocytes, so f they're not as dark, and they're calling them golden zebrafish. They, they didn't necessarily want to produce a lighter zebrafish. We experiment with zebrafish. They're a good model organism for a lot of different reasons. We can discuss this in the, uh, in the future. But this idea of a model organism, we had introduced earlier in the last semester, um, a model organism is just something that we can study, we can experiment with, and apply those results to uh, associated species so we can we can experiment with zebrafish fairly easily easily because they're cheap uh, because they're uh, e easy to maintain and cheap to maintain uh, they produce a lot of babies um, they're they don't have a large uh, society there's not a, as much uh, what's the word there's not as much ethical consideration when it comes to zebrafish as one might find using for instance a dog or a uh, chimpanzee or a human, obviously a human, I hope you're, it's obvious to you. So we can experiment with zebrafish a little more. F now, why, why is, why experiment with zebrafish at all to, when talking about humans? Well, zebrafish, for instance, have a lot in common with humans. We're both vertebrates. They're vertebrates, all right? They have we they have many concert many genes that humans have. Interestingly, they have external fertilization, which means it's easy to manipulate which egg finds which sperm because it happens outside the body. The male, the female fish lays the eggs outside uh, in the water, and then the male fish lays the sperm in the water, and they fertilize outside outside the uh, their bodies. The embryos are clear, so it's easy to see them develop, and we can I easily identify uh, structures that would be f difficult in an, in a different organism if we were going to try to do some experiments with. And they produce a lot of babies. at once, let's call them offspring. I always say babies, but they're not really babies, right? So a lot of offspring at once. And they, they have, they, they have, they mate often. We can separate them and not mate them. So we can choose when to mate them and when not to mate them. That's also very, very useful when you're trying to look at genetic studies or, or anything that has to do with, with controlling which genes get mixed with which genes. So zebrafish are a very good uh, working model, uh, um, um, a model for experimentation that we often use to, and then as a first step to understanding how something works, that, that we can then do more experiments with organisms that are closer to humans. And... Uh, because they mate often, we can, and the generations are short, their lifespans are short, their generations are short. We can, we can see many generations uh, in the laboratory and examine the results. Um, and again, we can apply them to, to humans. And we, it's used in medical research, they're used in genetics research. Uh, so the zebrafish are very, a very powerful model organism. Another model organism you might have heard of is uh, a white mouse. A mouse is, a, is another model organism that scientists will use. Uh, it, they're common, again, for many of the same reasons, except that they're not clear and they don't externally uh, fertilize, but they're, they're closer closer. 
to humans because they're mammals they're, and they're not just vertebrates. In other words, they just don't have a backbone, but they're also uh, mammals. So they're, they, we share more genes with them than we do with zebrafish. We have less differences between us. They still have a lot of offspring. They mate often. They, 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 they're sexually mature early. So we can, and mice are, very, and they're easily kept. They're cheap to upkeep. They're cheap to have, cheap to feed. This is all very important when you have limited funds. So another good model organism, the mouse, uh, Drosophila. Drosophila is a fruit fly. Another great organism, model organism. By the way, all of these we've sequenced their genome. So we know their genes, all their genes. Drosophila are also known as fruit flies. They're those, those little flies that buy, when you go to the store, your mom comes back from the grocery store, they're usually hanging out around the fruit and they, they start bugging you a little bit. They die quickly, but uh, Drosophila are just fruit flies and they're very useful for experimentation. Now, these are very different. They're not vertebrates, right? They, they're, not, they're not mammals, so you probably want to do experiments with Drosophila first because they're the cheapest and they, all these, except they're not externally, uh, they don't externally fertilize and their embryos aren't clear. Other than that, they're cheap to up, cheapest to upkeep, fastest reproductive, largest groups. This is really good for studying genes and how they're inherited, how some basic mechanics, we do share some genes with Drosophila, how those basic genes work, those, those con really old conserved genes work. Zebrafish uh, then could be, are a little more modern, a little closer to humans. And then mouse is the closest to humans. So when we look at the different uh, model organisms, it all depends on what it is you're trying to do when you're trying to decide which model organism to use. Okay, now we do use, of course, other organisms that are even closer, uh, dogs, uh, chimpanzees. They're just more expensive. There's a lot more ethical considerations. I mean, if you kill a bunch of fruit flies, very few people will complain. There'll be very, very few ethical considerations. There are still, they're living creatures. We should be concerned with mistreating them, but they're less than you would with, uh, you know, with a dog and especially, you know, when we do experiments in, in, with humans. And we do do experiments. There are things called clinical trials that are done on humans voluntarily uh, in order to test new drugs. They have to be tested. Uh, but first, we want to go through our model organisms and make sure we're not minimi we're minimizing the danger to humans. We test all our drugs and new understandings on these types of model organisms. So zebrafish are a model organism, and in this case, they, they scientists created this, this lighter version of zebrafish. So now let's take a look at this question. What do you think is the difference between golden and black striped zebrafish? Well, the amount of melanin, right? So likely a gene or a series of genes have been impacted so that this melanin is lighter if it's inheritable, if this difference is inheritable, and it seems like it is according to the reading, they don't really come out and say it. Let's see. Uh, I'm reading here with a few. So these are two different sets of genes that that impact the zebrafish uh, coloration. So can you think of any species in an animal kingdom? Now these are differences, but are they, here's the question for you and this, this person, this, uh, and Jake's father already answered this. These two are different. This has less melanocytes or lighter than this one. Are they different species? And according to this, the question is, have you this, has this one accumulated enough differences that we can call this a different species? Will they mate in nature? If they found each other in nature, will they mate and make babies? 
And the answer to that is yes, they would. And are the differences significant enough to, to really call them a different species? The answer would be no. So these are the same species. They're just two different variants. What do you think? Uh, uh, can you think of any other species in an animal kingdom that exhibit variations in coat color or skin color? Species of animal can exhibit color, colorations of coat color or skin color. Well, we already went through uh, different species that look different, right? But if you think of humans, we have different, uh, you know, we have different uh, skin color. Uh, when we look at dogs, we can look at um, birds. So there's a lot of animals that, ha that vary in color and that are still in the same species. In fact, cardinals are really a deep red where uh, female, the male cardinals are real deep red where the, uh, the female is not, such, not so colorful. So there are variations in nature. Dogs, obviously, uh, a, a dog, all dogs are the same species. They can all have babies with each other. They will mate with each other easily in nature where they're found. But as you know, you can have a black dog, a white dog, a gray dog, a brown dog. And, and each, in fact, these things we call breeds, which are not different species, have different traits that we've, we, we, we encourage by mating only other dogs with the same coloration or same traits. They're not different enough to be a different species. In fact, what we would call them, what a breed is in, in science would be a population because, you know, those are, uh, they're not a species, right? So we would call each breed a population. But for, we call them breeds because we humans artificially have created dogs since they would, they, uh, in nature, they would have been gray wolves. Uh, originally were gray wolves. Over time, we've created dogs. We've created the various breeds of dogs by making sure we mate, you know, little dogs with little dogs. We created chihuahuas, big dogs with big dogs. We got the Irish wolfhound. That's what we call breeding programs. We do that on purpose. Obviously, all the same species still. In part one of the case study as was skin color. One of the characteristics important characterizing racial groups is all the differences. So was skin color one of those characteristics that would, would define the different groups? Uh, you know, that's the one I just, I, I used as an example. I'm sure there were others you could have thought of. Sure, there are others, but realistically, there aren't that many differences between the quote-unquote races when it comes to uh, uh, the traditional sense, if you can, uh, of, of the traditional word of the, of the word, uh, use of the word race. Name factors that you think account for skin color differences between human beings. So uh, you can talk about evolution. You can talk about, uh, but bottom line, we know that skin color is inherited in some way. It's, uh, there, there are alleles and genes that influence the, how much pigment you have in the, in the skin. And but then again, you also have how much sunlight you're exposed to right? Uh, how many vitamins you have? Do you have the proper vitamins? If you, have the pro uh, if you lack certain vitamins, you'll look more pale. If, you, if, you have a, uh, if you're not able to produce the melanin, you might have the gene, but not be able to produce the melanin. Just to remind you that what we're talking about here is a gene. The gene then makes a protein. And this takes all kinds of resources, vitamins, amino acids, uh, etc. So when, you, when you're talking about, uh, uh, about vitamins or amino acids, you don't have them enough and you can't produce the protein, then you're not going to be, uh, then you, you might look paler. However, if you're, if you're uh, not going out in the sun very much, the melanocytes will not, uh, your skin won't get darker, so you'll be paler. So environmental influences would be the point. 
that even after you have the protein, even as the, just in the protein's function, the environment can influence this, this trait, how dark something is. All right, let's move on. So with skin color and the different races, what we're dealing with is, again, the word race is social. And in, in science, we would use populations. So the differences between the populations uh, and the skin color in populations would be genes, a collection of genes, the gene pool, the alleles in that population. Just like as we discussed with sickle cell, you have a different set of alleles that can be found. And how do you know what alleles are in that gene pool? Well, it depends who's mating with who. And then traditionally when we think about... Uh, You know, when we when we read when we read the story, you see that that mom's mom got freckles and red skin, where dad did not. And the question is why? Because dad had genes from his from his ancestry that allowed him to have enough. And I'm using the word genes a plural on purpose that allowed him to be to absorb sunlight and not react as well. The red skin is actually damaged to the skin. And the freckles are the few melanocytes that mom did have, the little groupings of melanocytes, uh, started to uh, get darker in order to try to protect the, those areas of the skin where it could. That red skin is damaged. It, it could lead to skin cancer eventually. So anytime you get a sunburn, anytime you even get tan, that's UV radiation impacting your genes, impacting your skin, your living cells. So you need to regulate that. You need to reduce that. And too much sunlight is, is no good for you. Well, you, unless you're using something to help re reduce the amount of negative impact of too much sunlight on your skin, like, uh, you know, uh, skin uh, protectant, SPF. So in any case, who's mating with who is what determines the skin color, uh, the differences but then again, you also have the environment, how much sunlight is, are, the, are you being exposed to. So you have your own personal history. So it's you. And then all your ancestors that came before you. What genes did they give you? Not just mom and dad, but their mom and dad. Because it's not just one gene that determines skin color. It's uh, multiple genes and multiple alleles, so we're, you nev you're never really sure what combination you have or your parents have, unless you've sequenced the DNA. You can look at moms and dads in your family tree all the way back, uh, as far back as you have records for, uh, and look at their skin tone if you have any kind of records that help you, help you do that, but that's really a limited use. Uh, so there are genes that we know impact skin color, but there's just many of them, or a numerous, uh, uh, more than one of those genes involved. So it's not something as simple as a dominant and recessive inheritance. So this is an interesting concept. So here you have a characteristic, expect Jake's mom and dad, let's say mom is lighter skin, she gets red easily in the sun, or at least easier than Jake's dad. Uh, she gets freckles. Jake doesn't. His skin, his skin color really, his skin tone does not. It, it, under the same so, sun exposure, Jake's dad doesn't really react to the sun where mom does. What other characteristics would you expect when you look, when you think of Jake? What other character traits would you expect to see that would be different between mom and dad? So we know Jake's dad's likely darker, and li Jake's mom is li is likely lighter, and. Jake's mom is sensitive uh, to the sun where Jake's dad isn't. What other characteristics, what nose, ears, eyes, hair, would you, would you have expected to see?
And how did race influence that image of Jake's dad and Jake's mom in your mind? Just to be clear, there is no biological link between skin color and any other trait. So, well, to my knowledge, so you can, it's you can have, you know, any uh, you know straight hair, curly hair, uh, uh, straight nose, uh, uh, curved nose. Uh, Attached earlobes, de- disattached earlobes, large ears, small ears, uh, you know, all the other traits of a face or body, none of these are, are directly related to skin color. But it's interesting that race is often first identified by skin color and then other traits are associated with it, with each of those, uh, with the various races. Uh, but they don't necessarily travel together because, um, well, first, Mendel's law of segregation, we know how genes move. We've studied them, and when we looked at mitosis and meiosis, we know that these genes don't travel to, uh, they don't necessarily have to travel together. They can be mixed up fairly well, and one doesn't necessarily influence the other, and it turns out skin color is doesn't influence the other traits it doesn't mean you're tall if you have dark skin for instance or you have uh blue eyes if you have light skin or what have you you can have various combinations and why is that and how and what does that say about race how how measurable how dependable is that word race seems a lot less dependable than the word species even though species itself is still slightly questionable This discussion is about vitamin D and UV radiation and how being exposed to UV radiation stimulates vitamin D production. And when you think about uh, in Africa having such direct sunlight versus up north, we have less direct sunlight, how the survivability of these individuals uh, would change a population that, li- that went from Africa into the north. The, a different group of people would have survived in the north without any assistance, without any technology, and than would in Africa. So, and by the way, this still this even leads to issues today here in the north, where we have so much less sunlight, and even when we there is sunlight, so few of us actually go into the sun for various reasons. Consider that vitamin D deficiency is a big problem in our society. And one of the reasons is we're not getting enough sunlight. We're not getting enough sunlight in part, uh, obviously, because we don't go out. We're inside often. Uh, We're not outdoorsy people the way we used to be as a species or as a population. And then the other thing is that there's so many of us have darker skin so far up north that it it would take more sunlight to get vitamin D production than the lighter skinned individuals would. So someone who's lighter skinned could get that same vitamin D production that might take two or three times as much time for us to be in the sun to get that vi- the same vitamin D production if you have darker skin. So <clears throat> it's, it's not a surprise that vitamin D is not, is not made in our, it is not, is a deficiency, is a, is a public health issue uh, in the United States. But this also talks about uh, this also talks about other you know other impacts and it's a very interesting read on what vitamin D actually how it impacts your health the fact that it makes your bones brittle if you don't have enough of it and when you think about Australia uh, presently Australia is populated by lighter skinned individuals a lot of lighter skinned individuals those are the their ancestors moved there from Europe, from England uh, and Ireland. They went down into Australia. They're part of the British, or were part of the British Empire. The original inhabitants were Aborigine, and they were dark-skinned. They actually had uh, wavy hair, and uh, if you ever looked at an Aborigine uh, uh, native Australian, it's uh, it's interesting. Their their features are, are very interesting. Uh, that they're, they're different. That they migrated to that population migrated to Australia sixty thousand years ago, and they're still human. They're still they're they're still same race. They're not that population 
of genes is it has been isolated longer than other populations on the planet because uh, they, they moved there 60,000 years ago and only historically, relatively recently, probably in the, like, well, I don't know when Australia was founded, but, you know, it was uh, those, the, the European populations probably got there no earlier than the 16, 1700s. Uh, so you can imagine how much more time they've had to isolate. So their population, their gene pool is more different than uh, a lot of the other places in the world, uh, specifically because they've been, that population has been isolated. But still, even, even then, the word species or different species or populate can't really be applied here. They're still human. Uh, we're, still, we're all one species. We're all one human race. And we can identify that. Uh, this this is a, another good example of why race really doesn't work very well because you can't really say, well, Aborigines, they have. Now, you could talk about the Aborigine population having the population having a, a gene pool and that that gene pool can then impact their health. That you can talk about. You can talk about African-Americans having a gene pool that it makes them susceptible to uh, getting sickle cell anemia, for instance, or having sickle cell trait that is found more prevalently in the African American population, we can say that, and that's that's valid. So, in that in that sense, it it's a useful term, but race itself is not something that could easily be identified. It's not very useful. So, for instance, if a dark skinned individual came into your office as a doctor, and you assume that person was was African-American. You'd ex you would assume, this is a, this is a, the, the, you're assuming that, you're assuming they're, they're black and you're going to, that that somehow makes them uh, from the same gene pool. But that's not true. African-Americans have a very different gene pool from people from Africa. Right or from Brazil, or from the Caribbean, all of them. Probably African Americans are much more similar uh, to the Caribbean folk than from Africa or Brazil. These populations have been isolated for longer. Uh, they have both culturally and physical spaces, like the Atlantic Ocean, separating them. Brazil is obviously much further away where these populations have been closer together and have, have socialized and they've shared genes between the populations um, much, uh, much more recently. So the gene pools here are much more similar. But someone who just looks at someone going into a doctor's office, assuming no accent, these, uh, you know, if they're the child of to African parents who grew up in America, they have no accent, they go to a doctor's office, someone assumes they're black, has the gene pool that's here in this yellow, and treats them such, they could actually be mistreating them because the gene pool is different, significantly different. The same thing with Australian Aborigine, right? The Australian Aborigine is even a different gene pool, and they all might have dark skin. So to assume someone is black and therefore has is sickle cell anemia has or has sickle, might have sickle cell trait or might this is not it, it's not useful. In fact, it could actually be harmful. It could be very much misleading and have people mistreat. So today we're doing much better because we're actually sequencing DNA of patients or that's where that's the direction we're going individuals are getting sequenced DNA and they're getting targeted drug therapy so this is getting better but in the past this has caused a lot of issues okay and this, by the way the same thing can be said about quote unquote white uh, the white race so you say the word white uh, if you know, there's a there's a big difference between, let's say, a population from the Amish who isolate themselves 
and only marry, uh, and traditionally have even married cousins to cousin, uh, and within uh, Amish communities, uh, when you look at uh, Hasidic Jew, oh, I don't know how to spell Hasidic, Hasidic Jewish populations, again, traditionally, I self isolating. Uh, due to their religion or culture, uh, all of them could be very light-skinned, very much white, right? Uh, versus someone whose parents are more recently from Germany. Uh, or another, another person, another group, um, maybe uh, British. Uh, let's say, let's be more specific and say English. These are all very different populations and gene pools that have very specific different types of genes in them. They might share one or two of those characteristics that we that you, that you talked about when you talked about race, and that's how you would call it. But if you just use race to qualify them as white or black, then you would you would be doing a disservice to uh, to their health if you tried to treat them as such. So there really is, biologically speaking, much more useful to talk about populations. So as we've discussed, the lighter skin person is obviously gonna get more radiation exposure uh, from the sun, increased radiation exposure from the sun, which can then lead to uh, increased radiation exposure from the sun, which can then lead to other issues, other problems, cancer, uh, sunburn, obviously, uh, it could lead to uh, all, all kinds of other uh, side effects from getting that excess radiation exposure. Would a darker skinned individual have a harder time or easier time making vitamin D? Uh, a harder time because uh, the sunlight's not getting into the blood. Harder time for vitamin D uh, folic acid is would be uh, preserved so they could eat more easily keep folic acid. How, because remember, folic acid is broken down by the sun. So the darker skin helps protect folic acid. But it, uh, if you're not getting enough direct sunlight, however, vitamin D is difficult to make. How do you think early humans in sub-Saharan adapted to have darker skin color? Well, they probably spent more time... In the sun, they had to. In sub-Saharan Africa, you, they were hunters and gatherers, and there isn't, there aren't a lot of trees in sub-Saharan sub-Saharan Africa, so you had to hunt down whatever food supply or gather whatever su food supply. Often in the in the daylight, since at night you had a lot of large predators uh, that w might be coming for you, lions, uh, you know, uh, uh, and other uh, cats. Uh, large mammal predators. You don't want to be outside uh, walking the Serengeti uh, at night. So the, you do it during the, uh, in the sunlight, so having darker skin truly uh, and, st and spending that time in the sun, producing that vitamin D, uh, the darker skin protecting you against their folic acid from being broken down. Uh, and they probably came up with ways of regulating that. Uh, you probably culturally set aside time on the hottest part of the day or the most so direct part of the day. You, you probably were uh, finding shade. And then uh, did your, you might maybe, and this is just a guess, maybe uh, the most active work would be done in 
at dusk or uh, during the, the twilight hours or during the sunset hours uh, where the individuals uh, would have less, not too much skin exposure or sun exposure. Because even though the, mel- the darker skin, the higher melanin concentration does help, it's still, uh, you still can get you know, overwhelmed with all that radiation. How do you think African immigrants to Europe and Australia has tra- tackled sunlight by gaining a lighter skin tone? Well, and if you think about it, less sun, less direct sun, shorter days, as we just got through winter, you know that, shorter days, less direct sun, uh, by having the lighter skin toned individuals survive better because they were able to make more vitamin D. Uh, there wasn't, there was less to be worried about with the, the destruction of folic acid. So their bones weren't as brittle as those that were might perhaps were darker in the, in this, in these conditions of less direct sunlight. So they were able to survive better and those that survived better had more babies. Uh, the, we, the females chose that, chose that babies with them more often. They were able to supply more food for those babies. Those babies survived more often. And so they, over time, they got lighter and lighter. What is the similarity between black striped zebrafish and early Africans and the gold zebrafish in Northern Europeans? Well, just like with zebrafish in humans, the black striped zebrafish were uh, the originals, right? uh, They originally had the darker skin tone, uh, darker uh, pigment in their skin. uh, And as conditions changed, the the golden zebrafish were developed. And the difference is this happened by, uh, by way of scientists in a lab, by artificial conditions in a, in a, uh, in a fish tank. This didn't happen in nature, but this, this, the Africans and North Americans happened in nature. So getting that lighter skin tone, that was a natural event that occurred over thousands of years, tens of thousands of years. How would you define a gene? What do you think gene, uh, how do you think genes play a role in transitioning from darker to lighter lighter skin color? Uh, Well, it depends on what you mean by transitioning. I I believe what they're talking about is is seeing humans in populations in Africa that were darker uh, and then humans in in lighter, uh, in northern areas having lighter skin. And what you have to think about is that you had this gene pool, back to that idea of a gene pool in Africa, where the people that had these particular genes, and they were probably a collection of genes that were for darker skin, right? Those individuals survived in those high light conditions very well. But as since genes are inherited, they can only be inherited and then passed down through the generations if the individuals survive. So anybody that died too early or they died before they could have babies did not contribute to the gene pool. So as you move further and further north over time, each one, each time you stopped and had a little village or a town or a country, each individual population equilibrated. You had a set of genes that worked for that environment. If they were too light or too dark, they didn't survive as much. And over time, what you saw is that the gene pool had a collection of genes that lent, meant that that population had a specific skin color, skin tone. The most northern in, uh, populations being what people call white, very pale skin, and then everything in between. The reason is that the, is the, the, fur, the ones in the furthest north with the shortest days and the least direct sunlight, these individuals had to spend, and in the cold, by the way, on top of that, so even when it was, when there was daylight, you weren't exposing your skin to it, you'd freeze to death. So these individuals over time developed, uh, developed genes that allowed them to take advantage of every second of sunlight and absorb every, every, uh, every, every ray of sunlight that they could into their skin to, do, to improve their vitamin D concentration uh, 
where the opposite is likely true of the original uh, African gene pool and something in between with all the rest of these of these stops uh, ge uh, geographically of each population. So Africa, Middle East, uh, Asia, and everything in between. How do you think scientists uh, created golden zebrafish from the original black striped zebrafish? They bred them, right? Just like we did with dogs, they chose individuals that had certain characteristics and they ended up making this, this, this uh, lightened version of, of, of zebrafish. In other words, they only allowed the lighter zebrafish to mate for whatever reason they were doing it. Uh, and so ultimately you had a population that only had the gene pool, a gene pool of, or a collection of genes that gave you light, uh, lighter uh, pigmentation in the zebrafish. This, again, happened in nature, naturally, where this happened in the lab and we, we under controlled conditions. Individuals. So... A DNA mutation, a mutation is just, you have a gene. A gene is A, T, G, C, A, T, whatever. It's very long. That gene makes a protein. To keep it short, it can make an RNA, but let's just keep it short. It goes gene, gene, which is DNA, in DNA, makes... RNA, which makes a protein, all right? So that's the sequence of events. That's what a gene is. So a gene is a sequence of DNA that codes for a protein or an RNA molecule. This, as we talked about earlier with sickle cell, this protein with the sickle cell, if you remember the difference in, between the two hemoglobins, this protein is what it is because of this gene sequence. If you, if you changed this G to a C. So you have instead, oops, excuse me. If you have instead dot, 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 A, T, C, G, uh, C, C, A, T. So if these two changed, if this G got changed to C, it would still make RNA. It would still make RNA, but it would make, it could make, not necessarily, it could make a different protein. Now, this could mean there's no difference in the protein. We'll talk about that later when we talk about transcription, actually, that's the next unit. But when we look at the different, uh, whether we get a different protein or not, this is called a mutation. It's called a mutation because you change the DNA. You change the mutations happen all the time. There are mistakes in the when we copy the DNA. There's mistakes are made. The it could be because of chemicals. It could be because of sunlight, for instance, right? The the very UV light that's hitting people uh, could could mutate the DNA. It could just be a random mutation that happens. Those random mutations, a lot of them are what we call silent. A silent mutation is just something that that doesn't make a difference in the protein. So when the mutation is silent, there's no change in the protein. Since there's no change, we call it silent. Or it could change the protein in some way, like in sickle cell, right? Either way, the, muta the change in the DNA is called a mutation. How do you think DNA mutations would have regulated skin color in different populations compared to Sub-Saharan African and Northern Europeans. So first, before, and before nature can pick which ones survive and which ones don't, there has to be a difference between individuals in the population. So mutations have to happen first. So they had to have, people had to have the genes for lighter skin in order for them to be chosen to survive. Otherwise, nobody would have survived. If the genes weren't there, then there's no way for nature to select. We call that natural selection. So natural selection only works if the, individu if the individual alleles or, or mutations already exist. 
So mutations come first. In fact, they drive evolution. So you have a certain gene pool, the pool of genes, where you can select from. The more there are differences, the more diversity, the more genetic diversity you have in a population. As you know, sex is all about creating genetic diversity because that is a strength for the population. The more diverse a population, the more likely that population is to survive. Now, when you put individ uh, when you put this population under an extreme event like incredibly direct sunlight in Africa, or lack real ex incredibly lack of sunlight in Norway in the winter winter months in Norway, you know, very short days and not very direct sunlight, hard to find, you know, you're hunting and gathering in the snow. Uh, so this is going to put a lot of pressure on this population to survive. Not everyone in this population is going to survive. It's likely going to be the lighter, the individuals with the, the individuals with the, the genes that allow them to be lighter are the ones that get to survive and have babies and keep having babies over time. So genes, mutations provide diversity in the gene pool. And as nature, by way of the environment, puts pressure on a population, kills those that are not, fit, are not best fit to survive, the population, the number of genes change. So slowly but surely, the, the genes for darker skin color start to become less and less in the northern population. And the genes in the southern populations in sub-Saharan Africa uh, have more and more of the genes and alleles for darker skin color in this population. As long as the two don't mix, as long as someone from here doesn't come over here and, and marry, these two populations can, can sustain their their lighter or darker uh, genes, the genes for lighter, darker skin, the frequency of those genes can be sustained as long as they're not the, there's no there's no migration or immigration, right? So not, no individuals are coming into the gene pool or leaving the gene pool. How scientists employ organisms like zebrafish to unearth the mystery of skin color? Well, we already discussed that with model organisms, right? So we can. We can breed them, we can, just like Mendel did with peas, we can breed them, we can cross them, we can look at see how they're inherited. We can put them under different, uh, under different uh, conditions, lighter, uh, you know, uh, we can put in artificial selection. We can experiment by adding a lot of sunlight or, or reducing the sunlight and see what happens, which individuals survive and which don't. So when we look at skin color it's not one trait remember when we talked about dominant versus recessive and we said with dominant recessive you get either one you know tall or short there's two options two traits right so with dominant recessive there's two traits You get, the, you get tall if you have the big A, whatever. As long as you have one big A, you're tall. And you get a recess if you have two little A's. Same with sickle cell, right? Then we said, well, there's other kinds of inheritance, like incomplete inheritance, incomplete, which we talked about as being kind of a mix between the two, so red and uh, white. And so red might be a big R, big R. And white might be a big W, big W. But then you have this third, uh, third trait or third phenotype. It's pink. And that's when you have a big R and a big W. So you got three. There's three different traits, right? Three different phenotypes. Three different phenotypes. Here you only had two phenotypes. Here you have three phenotypes. Three phenotypes. 
So that 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 that's uh. So when we're talking about this trait there, there's two, and this one is three, and we talked about codominant and the phenotypes again. Let's say uh, white is big W, big W, black is uh, big B, big B. So that's one phenotype. There's two phenotypes. It also has three phenotypes. I mean, it's white and black. And white with black, white and black. Big W, big B. Again, three phenotypes. So when we're talking about skin tone or skin color in humans, Is it white or black? Is it white or black? Or is it more 64 shades of skin tone? Varying skin tones. Yes, it's impacted by environment, but assuming the same sunlight exposure, you're going to have 64 different shades possible, not even including albino. Which is a whole other conversation. The albinos are recessive, the way, the way, let's say. They control the master gene, and without that, without that gene, if you have without at least one dominant version of that gene, you get none of the other sixty-four shades. So sixty-four shades is not, it's not dominant or recessive. It's not just one gene with two alleles. It's not even three alleles like with red uh, ABO blood groups, right? ABO blood groups, you have multiple alleles, right? You have two gene, you have one gene. And you have uh, I, you know, I A. Uh, you have, and they're codominant. I A and I B are codominant, and then you have uh, I. You know, uh, you have the recessive. Actually, you have the recessive little I, little I, which is O blood type, right? So I big A. And then, so you have A and B. You have A and B. So with three, with multiple alleles, you could have, you know, numerous outcomes. You could have A, B, A, B. Or O. So you can have up to four different, right? Maybe even five. But with 64 shades, it's unlikely you're going to have that, you know, one gene with that many different alleles. So it's likely you're going to have multiple genes involved here and to create skin tone in whatever way it's regulated. How much melanin, how dark, what's the reaction rate of the skin to the, dark, to the sunlight, et cetera, et cetera. So it's the fact that you have so many phenotypes that progress from darkest to lightest. They go from darkest to lightest. Based on what you've under, you have understood about skin color in this case, study, draw some conclusion on how DNA mutations could benefit the establishment of races across the globe, focus on skin color adaptations. So again, not liking the word race, but it is a reality. Our society does talk about it. The focus of, on skin color adaptations. Again, if you gene pool, if you have multiple genes, 60, you know, however, 64 different shades, you have a large, and you have a, a gene pool that allows you to have a lot of different individuals, a lot of genetic diversity. And even if one gene becomes less frequent, another gene might not. And so you get this that, that allows for a lot of genetic variation. So as the environment subtly changes, you can have subtle differences in skin tone going from sub-Saharan Africa all the way to the north. And you see that. You, could, you can see in traditional, in traditional societies of paintings, etc. 
as you go from one end of of the world to the other from the south the southernmost to the northernmost you get you get kind of a a, a darkest and to the lightest gradation of human skin color so the adaptations the folk the adaptations uh the 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 natural selection pressures uh, having that many genes and those many variations, because remember we're talking about numerous genes, but they also have likely more than one allele each. So there's a lot of different variation that you can get. So 64 different shades. And so you can have a population, let's say, and I'm just going to make this up, you know, sub-Saharan Africa. Let me, let me, you have sub, no, nope, that's too thick. You have sub-Saharan Africa. Oh, let me try blue. Sub-Saharan Africa. Then you have, you know, maybe Middle East. And maybe you have, uh, well, let's, let's even do this. Nor- Northern Africa, uh, Middle East. You have Southern Europe. You have Middle Europe. And then you have uh, Northern Europe. And then you have everything that's in between. They get from the darkest all the way to the lightest. Uh, each population, each of these is a gene pool that's established because of the conditions of where they grow, where they live. Explain science beyond Jake's final statement. Uh, so when you're looking at other traits and when you look at Jake's treat, uh, statement about other characteristics when it comes to race, again, I, I don't like to use the, to use the word race because it population is so much better. But in any case, when we look at the word race, much more, this is something that's simple, right? That has a very direct relationship between why would skin, t- skin color change over various environments, populations over various environments over time. Because sunlight, and we looked at all the biochemistry behind it, very easily measurable, identifiable cause. We call that natural selection. Nature, the environment, is choosing which of the people in that, which of the genes in the gene pool are best fit for survival in that environment. And as you move north, the environment changed and different individuals were chosen by nature to survive in that particular environment. So the gene pool had the majority of the individuals in that gene pool had those, those characteristics. But there is no natural selection pressure for more complex behavior or uh, traits like intelligence or, uh, 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 well, I shouldn't say there's no natural selection pressure. There's no, there's no differentiating. Na- in other words, it doesn't take more intelligence to survive here in the north than it does in the south. The conditions are different, but they, you can't say that we wouldn't expect this kind of change over over this over these environmental changes because the pressures that the natural selection pressures that would that would select individuals in this population <coughs> would not select, for instance, uh, people with musical ability here versus no musical ability up here, or vice versa. So there's really no uh, other than these these very direct. Uh, characteristics or traits that have that can be tied directly to uh, impacting the the survival of individuals in a population therefore the those alleles in that population it's very it's very difficult to see how many other characteristics that we associated with that we associate with humanity would be able to to be impacted by this type of, of natural selection so with natural selection what we're going to be looking for is you're going to be looking at, uh, for this environmental natural selection, you're looking for direct elimination of individuals because of a lack of a trait or because they have a trait. So if an individual had the, dark, had the genes for darker skin way up north, they wouldn't survive very, very long, so nature would select against them and they would die someone were born here or had the gene combination of light skin, 
in sub-Saharan Africa, you know, a couple thousand years ago, they would likely not survive in sub-Saharan Africa. And we see that that's true with albinos. Very few albinos, and I'm not talking about just humans, because since albinos happen in just about every, every uh, living creature except plants, albinos don't survive very long. And that's because albinos, uh, uh, for various reasons, are, are, are selected against in the environments that, that they're uh, born into. All right, so that takes us as to why we think there's multiple genes involved. So again, if you look at these two, uh, there really isn't much uh, in way of connecting race to specific uh, to specific traits. So try to consider, uh, you don't have to worry about this particu- these particular uh, activities. I don't think it's worth our time. We're running out of uh, a time and the course exam's coming up. I think what you wanted to get out of this activity is, is several fold, at least I, what I hope you got out of it, is that race is a social construct. Race itself is a social construct that culture is real, uh, but race is something that's arbitrary and not very useful. Populations, however, are a really good way of looking at, populations are a very good way at looking at any living organism and this idea uh, uh, of a defined gene pool. So a pool of genes or alleles in a population that's transmitted from father, from uh, ancestor uh, to ancestor down uh, lineage, we call those populations. Uh, race can be, by the way, can be misleading and ill-defined. So not incredibly useful. Populations define, uh, define uh, a gene pool. Those are much more useful. Um, the traits, uh, and you know, you can look at uh, skin, as we talked about skin color, and we talked about how that can be misleading with, with even identifying a particular race, right? When we're looking at gene pools, and you're looking at populations, you have to consider that natural selection natural selection selects individuals natural selection selects individuals and those individuals are selected against they die before they can have babies or they're selected for they have babies and they send their genes to the next generation so when you're talking about race and you're talking about natural selection you talk about things that are inherited and you now you should have also some idea of hopefully you have some idea of how genes are inherited and how we can tell, how we can tell just by how many phenotypes, how that's a clue to how many, to the type of inheritance. And lastly, the fifth thing that I hope you got out of this is when we look at when we look at this thing called species, look at this thing called species that we all think we understand, it's not that simple. It's much better than the type, than the idea of, of race. It's a much better defined concept than race. It's not as easily defined as populations. It's not as easy as looking at a gene pool, a species. Uh, 
can have a lot of variations and there's a number of definitions. And when you actually get a new species can be sort of like the whole Pluto argument, is it a planet or is it a dwarf, uh, is it a dwarf planet or is it a planet? Uh, the, some of that is arbitrary. Some of, you know, it's, these are human constructs. As with any human endeavor, we hope in science to base it on facts and reason and definitions. But sometimes there is a lot of gray area and species, uh, the word species does have some gray area to it. So when we're looking at these terms, I hope this helped clarify the difference between race, species, phenotype, the connection between phenotypes and types of inheritance, what is natural selection, what, and the, I should say the sixth and probably last, the last note here is what is a mutation, right? And what, how does a mutation impact a population? So there's kind of six things I hope you got out of this case study. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope, I hope it was interesting. Um, and, uh, let's move on. Uh, we'll talk about this, uh, next, uh, next week. Uh, we should, hopefully you, com you completed it already.